Renowned cardiologist Pem van Lommel has written a book based on his interviews with hundreds of heart patients at his hospital who had all clinically died of cardiac arrest before being resuscitated. A significant percentage of these patients reported a near-death experience. The evidence Dr. Van Lommel has gathered supports the validity of the near-death experience and suggests that scientists should rethink their theories on the nature of human consciousness. Dr. Van Lommel offers a new paradigm for the 21st century that could change the way we view death and how we live our lives. Dr. Van Lommel, thank you so much for inviting me here for this interview. You're welcome. Now, I'd like to begin by asking, um, you know, I imagine that you can empathize with uh, scientists and physicians who adhere to a strictly materialistic paradigm because you were one of those yourself at one time. So how did your orientation begin to change? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a cardiologist, so um, I had the privilege to have patients who survived cardiac arrest. And after reading a book about near-death experiences by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, who had a near-death experience as a medical student in '43, I just started out of curiosity to ask patients who survived a cardiac arrest if they could remember something of this period of unconsciousness. And then, to my big surprise, within two years out of 50 patients I asked, eight, you know, 12 patients told me about the near-death experience. Uh -huh. And that's the moment my scientific curiosity started to grow because of, according to our current medical knowledge, it's impossible to experience consciousness during cardiac arrest when uh, circulation and breathing have ceased. So this is how it started for me. Were you comfortable expressing your curiosity to your fellow physicians? Well, there are a lot of physicians who are not open for it. Why not? Some, because it doesn't fit in our, the concept we've learned. And also I have learned as a medical student and as a young doctor that we have the assumption it shouldn't be discussed that consciousness is a product of the function of the brain. So that's the reason it's impossible to experience consciousness when you have a cardiac arrest. But is there any scientific evidence that uh, consciousness is produced by the brain? No, it's a, it's a non-proven assumption. It's just an hypothesis. But everybody accepts it because most people have the experience that you experience consciousness when, you, when you're awake. Mm -hmm. So scientists who stressed the scientific method and the controlled experiment have uh, based their ideas about consciousness on an assumption. Yes, yes. Well, most scientific uh, assumption, <laughs> it, 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 research starts with assumptions and then you try to prove it. Mm -hmm. And um, as long as neuroscientists see activities in, in neuroimaging techniques, they believe that they see something Mm -hmm. which is, could be the consciousness. Right. Why is a cardiac arrest so important in the study of the near-death experience? Well, uh, it's important because there are many circumstances when people can report a near-death experience. Uh, but when you have survivors of cardiac arrest who tell you about an enhanced consciousness mm -hmm. with cognition, with emotions, with memories, etc also with the possibility of perception out and above the life of the body, then we know that this enhanced consciousness paradoxically occurs during the moment that patients are deep unconscious and when the brain is not functioning. So this challenge, the assumption that consciousness is a product of the functioning brain. When you began, your, uh, when you began to hear these stories about people telling you what happened d during a period of a so-called unconsciousness, what one item from this, uh, from the near-death experience impressed you the most? Well, each patient who were willing to share their experience with me is emotional, is impressive. It's, it's, it's honest, it's reluctance, it's emotion. Uh, they cannot believe them themselves and uh, they try to find words for it. And so it's, uh, when you talk to patients who are willing to share the experience, it's always impressive. Tell us what a near-death experience is. Yeah, well, the near-death experience for me is the reported memory of all expressions, uh, impressions during a period of 
an enhanced consciousness, a special state of consciousness with specific universal elements like uh, out-of-body experience, a tunnel, a light, a life review, or meeting deceased relatives or meeting a border. So these kind of elements have always been reported due, during um, uh, all times, all religions and, and all mankind. What are the major objections to reports of the near-death experience from people with a scientific orientation? The, what are the major objections to, the to the possibility of a near-death experience? Why do they say that this is uh, not possible? Well, it's because of the assumption that the uh, consciousness is a product of the function of the brain. And there have been a lot of retrospective studies done and there was still people believed that the uh, explanation of the cause, the content of an NE was just lack of oxygen or mm. the fear of death or uh, medication. medication or hallucination or whatever. And um, so it doesn't fit in our current medical concepts that mm -hmm. it is possible. Mm -hmm. So according to most scientists who specialize in consciousness research, consciousness arises entirely from the matter that comprises the brain. Therefore, mm -hmm. our consciousness is nothing other than the expression uh, of a machine controlled by classical physics and chemistry, and our behavior is the outcome of nurse, nerve cell activity in the brain. What this means is, isn't it true that there's no free will and we're essentially robots? If they would be right, then there would be no free will and consciousness is just an illusion. Yet there is evidence that consciousness can control the brain? Yes, uh, this what's what this is called neuroplasticity. That is, that the function and the structure of the brain can change due to changes in consciousness, which is well known, like say, in placebo effect. May you receive medication, a placebo medication for depression, or for pain, or for Parkinson's disease. May you not only see the clinical improvement of those patients, but when you do neuroimaging technique, you see those centers who are involved in pain, or depression, or in Parkinson's disease, are also improved. So you see changes in the brain due to the concept that people believe that they are treated. Mm -hmm. And also in, in mindfulness training or in med meditation, long-term meditation, you see changes in the brain due to this, due these techniques. Okay. So changes in consciousness give rise to change and function the structure of the brain. Your study was significant because uh, uh, many of the uh, reports of near-death experiences were retrospective, and yet your study is progressive. Why is the progressive approach to the near-death experience more significant? It's called prospective. Pro prospective, I'm prospective. sorry. Prospective. Prospective. Okay. Prospective. prospective. Prospective is that you, uh, what we did in, in the Dutch study, we started in 88, with all 344 pros, uh, consecutive patients who survived the cardiac arrest. So you have a medical a medical situation, which is cardiac arrest. And from this position, you ask patients if they have experienced something. When you have a retrospective study, then you ask patients if they would, by advertisement of after lectures, if they would uh, come to you and tell about their death. But you never know who will come and who will not come. Mm -hmm. People are not able to talk about experience, will not come, so there's an enormous amount of uh, selection of patients when you do retrospective studies and mm -hmm. you cannot f find out what really the medical circumstances were when it was 20 or 30 years ago. So in this prospective study with cardiac arrest we know exactly that patients were clinical death which is period of unconsciousness due to the stopping of ceasing of circulation and breathing and all those patients will die within five to ten minutes if resuscitation is not started. So they are in the beginning of the process of dying. And, uh, and if you do not resuscitate, resuscitate those patients, they will die within five to ten minutes because of irreversible brain damage. So this is a kind of situation where you know exactly what's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. 
And in these circumstances, you can really look after, you can put all the medical uh, uh, medical do documents, the, the, you can ask patients about the psychological factors, you can see what medication we're giving, etc. Mm -hmm. So you can look after all the factors who could explain the causal content of an NDE. Okay. So this must have uh, puzzled you. Well, well, how is consciousness possible uh, during a, a period uh, in which a person has experienced cardiac arrest? And from your book, I see that uh, in the, you cited the 2005 Journal of Science, which uh, published a special anniversary feature issue featuring 125 questions that scientists have so far failed to answer. The number one question that scientists have failed to answer is, what is the universe made of? Followed by the number two question, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And in your book you said that you would reformulate this question to, does consciousness have a biological basis at all? So where did this question lead you? Well, first, why did they ask this question? This is because of the result of our study. Because what we found in our prospective study of the 344 patients, that 62 patients, 80%, reported a near-death experience, and 282 patients, 82%, did not report a memory. And when we compared these two groups, there was no difference at all in the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, or the duration of unconsciousness, to five minutes or three weeks in coma, or the given medication, mm -hmm. or fear of death before the arrest, or foreknowledge that you know that it is possible that you can have this kind of experience, or gender, or education, or religion. So what was so striking and surprising for us that there is no explanation whatsoever why those 80% of the people have any death experience. There's no physiological explanation. So uh, the lack of oxygen to the brain is not an explanation at all because all those, 100% of those patients had an oxygen of the brain, lack of oxygen. There's no pharmacological explanation because the medication had no influence at all. And there was no psychological explanation. So we come to the, came to the conclusion that there is no explanation well-known explanation why people have this experience, but the experience is enhanced consciousness during a period of cardiac arrest when the brain is not functioning. Mm -hmm. So the second thing for us was, how do we know that the brain doesn't function? And then afterwards, when you have these, those answers, you can say, ask the question, is there a biological basis and a way for consciousness? I see. So where did that question lead you? Yeah. But to first tell you that, that we know that the brain doesn't function, mm -hmm. because I think that's important. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> because, and then you come to the conclusion, because first you have to scientifically prove that the brain doesn't function, because there are a lot of scientists, materialistic scientists as well, he looks, it, it is as if a patient is unconscious during cardiac arrest, but when they report consciousness, then there must have been there must have been conscious. So the brain must have been working somewhere because they keep on the concept, the assumption that the consciousness is a product of the brain. So when you can prove that the brain is not functioning, then you can discuss the never proven assumption that the consciousness is a product of the brain. So we know from some studies with induced cardiac arrest in in uh, people and also in, in animals that when you induce cardiac arrest, for instance, when you uh, do an implantation of ICDs, internal defibrillators, then you have induced cardiac arrest to do testing that it, you, you are sure that it is functioning. Then you see that within one second, the blood flow to the brain is zero. People are unconscious within one or two seconds. The body reflexes are gone, which is a function of the cortex of the brain. The brainstem reflexes are gone. So the gag reflex or the corneal reflex or the UFC dilated pupils. The breathing center has gone, which is close to the brainstem, so people don't breathe anymore. And when you measure the electro activity of the brain, which is an EEG, you see after an average of 50 seconds a total flatline. 
So the clinical findings and what you can measure uh, makes us aware that the brain doesn't function anymore after an average of 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. And we know in a well-organized coronary care unit, it, you need at least 60 to 120 seconds to do a successful resuscitation. Mostly it will be more. So we know from our study, 344 patients, that they all must have had a flatline EEG and still they had an enhanced consciousness, more consciousness than the normal waking consciousness we have now. So this makes the conclusion, how is it possible? Okay, how is it possible? Well, then we have to change our ideas about where consciousness comes from and where you believe that consciousness is a product of the brain, it's impossible. So for me, the brain has a, is, has a function of a transceiver. It receives information from consciousness and it sends information from our senses and body to our consciousness. So it is a transceiver, it's an interface function. So the brain makes it possible, that facilitates the uh, experience of waking consciousness when we are awake. But consciousness itself is not localized to the body and to the brain. It's not local, which is when people tell us about their experience of an enhanced consciousness and they have a life review of, let's say, during cardiac arrest of two minutes, they can talk for hours to days about what experience because there's no time and no distance during this experience. You have each thought you ever had is kept each word you have said and each act you've done with the influence on oneself or other you perceive. So, so, this, so, so this consciousness is in a dimension without time and space and this and everything is connected and this is what you call non-locality. So this is what I call non-local consciousness. Would it be appropriate to use the word spiritual to describe this state of non-locality? I know that many doctors, when, many scientists, when they hear this word, yeah. it's kind of the kiss of death to their profession. So, <laughs> but but it, it inevitably comes up. So, uh, would you call these religious experiences, spiritual experiences? I know it gets into quantum territory, yeah. but uh, could you? Uh, well, there are, there are so many words which uh, it can be used for this kind of experience. They say experience of oneness. They say experience of unity because everything is connected. They call it mystical experiences in the Middle Ages. It's also called mystical experience or um, enlightened experiences of experience of life inside. So there are so many words used for this kind of ineffable experiences. And people change. And they also, and that's an important aspect we can talk about it later, uh, they have about 100% of those people within that have much more interest in spirituality than before. So there are... Even atheists? Even atheists. So it's independent of the religion beforehand uh, that you changed. So it's the other aspect of the study we did. We had a mm -hmm. prospective study. We have a longitudinal or long-term study mm -hmm. with interviews after two years and eight years of all survivors of cardiac arrest right. with a matched control group of patients patient who did not have uh, an NDE to see if there's a kind of transformation they changed mm -hmm. is due to the cardiac arrest right. or due to the NDE because we didn't know and we found that the transformation is just the result of the NDE. Right. Uh, Dr. Van Lommel, at this point I'd like to ask you, as, yeah. as, as you were learning about the near-death experience yeah. and began to see that there was something very unusual going on here, what did this do to you personally? Well, it has changed my insight in life and death. I think you can say that. And I always tell the people that, the, the people with the death experience who were willing to share the experience with me have been my teachers, not only about the content of the ND, but also about the transformation. Mm -hmm. they, they tell me there is no fear of death. They don't have fear of death anymore. Death seem to be not death at all. So there's a continuity of consciousness and you see your body, lifeless body, somewhere down and you feel alive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they also tell me about the change of life inside. What is important in life is unconditional love and acceptance and compassion towards yourself and others and nature. And the third transformation is the enhanced intuitive sensibility. 
that they receive information not by your senses and your body, which is called, I could call it scientifically, non-local information exchange. Well, these kind of changes, as people share it with you, then you have to change all your concepts you had before, and I did. Mm -hmm. When uh, near-death experiencers talk about the importance of love, I imagine they were more ego-centered before this experience. So what is it about this experience that transforms someone from an ego-centered entity to a, a person who is genuinely concerned about the feelings of others? Yeah. Well, it's because in this experience, especially when you have a life with you, you experience that everything you do or think or act towards, towards someone else is at last, during this experience, affecting yourself. You feel the distress you cause to others. You feel the love you gave to others. So everything you give to others will come back to yourself. Love as well as aggression. And when you're aware of this effect on others, because you're in, an, in a different way, you're in a higher level of consciousness, you're all one, you're always connected. Uh, then you change your, the way you live because you know now you have an inner knowing that what you think even has effect on others. Mm -hmm. So what you do, so it's it's about also when you want to help your neighbor because you want to be loved by your neighbor. It's selfish motive. It's selfish motive. It's wrong. But where you have the intention to help, mm -hmm. this is right. And this kind of insight they they. they, they they receive in this experience. It must surprise you that during a life review a person can uh, see um, everything they've done and thought in their whole lives and this brings up questions of the brain can't possibly be the storehouse of, of uh, all these memories so if we can kind of revisit a territory we've already gone through I'm still perplexed about where these memories are stored. Yeah. Well, they're not stored in the body, body like you said. they're not stored in the brain because yeah. And that's shocking for scientists. That's shocking for scientists. At least it is new for scientists because we have always been thinking or believing, it's believing that everything is stored in the brain. Mm -hmm. And you have real new thoughts, new emotions uh, during this near-death experience when the brain doesn't function at all. You have the possibility of perception out and above your body when the brain is not functioning. Mm -hmm. And this out-of-body experience can have veridical perceptions, so it's real. And what they veridical meaning? Veridical meaning that you can, that they tell what happened to the body during resuscitation, okay. is corroborated by doctors and nurses and family members. Mm -hmm. So they say, "I saw this and I saw this," and they say, "Well, that's right. It it happened really." And so you can also corroborate the, the moment it happens, and you know that it was happening in the middle, mm -hmm. somewhere. Of the resuscitation. Right. So everything they experience is at the moment that the brain doesn't function. Mm -hmm. So it must be somewhere else and this is what I call the non-local consciousness where everything is stored. Right. Uh, and people can also see and hear. They can see without eyes. They can hear without ears. And I think there are reports of blind people who've mm -hmm. been blind from birth who can see. So this is a great puzzle. How is that possible? I, I can imagine how it might be possible to uh, uh, to have uh, memories stored outside of the brain. That's a stretch, but it's possible to conceive of that. But how is it possible to see and hear without the organs by which we normally think that we see and hear things? Yeah. Well, they don't hear, but they know the thoughts of people. So they don't hear voices, but they know what is said. But they do see. But they perceive. Perceive. I say perceive because it's not by your eyes. Your eyes are closed. And you perceive a theater at 60 degrees. You can see details and an overview at the same time. So it's a different kind of perception. And even blind people from birth can perceive. And I know people who have glasses, very strong glasses. They need to see something. And then I know a story of a woman who had a near-death experience and she was perceiving everything was going on during childbirth and she was, she nearly died, a lot of loss of blood. And then at once she, she saw her own glasses down near her bed <laughs> and, she re and then she realized, I can see now clear, but normally without her glasses she couldn't see anything, it was just crazy or so. so, mm -hmm. so um, 
the perce- but you can also ask who is perceiving when you are awake because there are uh, electromagnetic informations in the light which comes to your retina in your eyes and then you got electromagnetic information to your brain mm-hmm. but it is still information so the question is who is seeing who is transform forming this kind of information which is electrical magnetic information in your brain into a picture we can perceive mm-hmm. this is not your brain who is perceiving so how do you answer the question who is perceiving it that's the essence of who we are. This is consciousness. Consciousness is perceiving. And consciousness is non-local. And non-consciousness is non-local. For those of us who don't understand the concept of non-locality, could you explain that to us? Yeah. So non-locality is a dimension where there is no time and no space. So no distance. So everything is there. When you have a life review, you have access to all information you had during your whole life. Each thought each word, each act you did or had is kept with the effect on others. But you also can have a flash forward, a preview of things for the future. So in this dimension, the past, present and future is available. And everything is connected. It's entangled, it's, it's interconnected. So there's, when you, it's an analogy to quantum physics, which is non-local, is connected without time and uh, without space. Renowned cardiologist Pem van Lommel has written a book based on his interviews with hundreds of heart patients at his hospital who had all clinically died of cardiac arrest before being resuscitated. A significant percentage of these patients reported a near-death experience. The evidence Dr. van Lommel has gathered supports the validity of the near-death experience and suggests that scientists should rethink their theories on the nature of human consciousness. Dr. Van Lommel offers a new paradigm for the 21st century that could change the way we view death and how we live our lives. For those of us who don't understand the concept of non-locality, could you explain that to us? Yeah, so non-locality is a dimension where there is no time and no space. So no distance. So everything is there. When you have a life review, you have access to all information you had during your whole life. Each thought, each word, each act you did or had is kept with the effect on others. But you also can have a flash forward, a preview of things for the future. So in this dimension, the past, present and future is available. And everything is connected. It's entangled, it's, it's interconnected. So there's, when you, it's an analogy to quantum physics, which is non-local is connected without time and uh, without space. I think in some of the reports that you cite, people feel that when uh, they have this near-death experience, they've returned home and that this home that they report, this expanded uh, reality, is the same place that they came from and that uh, this home, this expanded reality, is real and the uh, life they just left is a dream. So can you expand on that? Yeah. Well, you're right. The, the people tell me that this was more real than ever, but they experienced it during their life. So during a period of so-called unconsciousness, what they experienced was more real? More real than ever. And That must have been shocking to you when you first heard that. 
it was shocking for the patients who experienced it. Uh -huh. And I felt this shock. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, so uh, they cannot believe it themselves. I, I, had, I know some physicians who had a near death experience, and they told me what happened to me now. I've always told everybody this is impossible, and now it happened to me. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't fit in our concepts. It doesn't fit in our materialistic concepts we have in science. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you're right. They tell us, I felt home. It's where I come from. This is more real than ever. Your research into the near-death experience shows conclusively that consciousness is non-local. And as you have said, this changes everything. The old materialistic paradigm is broken the egoic structure is shattered and we do not yet have a new paradigm and we need a new language and a new perspective to the universe so what is your idea of this new paradigm well, i think the paradigm is that we have to change science because science up till now is just you what you can measure is real and what you cannot measure is not there and then we have the problem of consciousness. We cannot measure consciousness. We cannot prove the content of consciousness. The science should change into accepting also the subjective aspects of, the, of, of, of mankind. So we have to include subjective experience as well, and not only objective criteria. And scientists, I think, have specifically excluded the subjective. Exactly, because you cannot prove it. And, and, and you cannot prove, prove your own experience? You cannot prove subjective experience. Right. People tell about it, but scientists want to prove it. And, and this, the, the long-term study we did is a, a kind of objective criteria because of the transformation is the objective aspect of a subjective experience. And we could prove that only the patient with a death experience changed significantly different from the people without, but who survived a cardiac arrest as well. But the patients who survived a cardiac arrest also changed, but mm -hmm. not as much as the... Different. 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 Not as much, but different. Uh, let's say that the, the fear of death is, disappears only with patients with the death experience. The new life inside especially, specifically changes for some aspects in people with NDE. And the third aspect, the enhanced intuitive sensibility, only changes in people with a death experience. The, the interest in spirituality is specific for people with an NDE. Mm -hmm. Dr. Van Lommel, I've asked you before how this changes your life, but you must feel, uh, concerning what you just told me, this uh, you must feel very passionate about your findings. Yes, I'm touched by it. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it changed me, but um, it changed my worldview. And, and uh, so when, uh, when we published our study, 10 year study in The Lancet in 2001, I had so many responses from throughout the world that at that moment I decided to stop my work as a clinical cardiologist right. at the age of 60 to do this, to, to study the mind-brain relationship and to write papers about it, to lecture all over the world, and mm -hmm. now at last to write a book. So what is essential, what needs to be done to change the idea of materialistically oriented scientists that uh, consciousness is non-local? Because when you do change this orientation, that consciousness is non-local, as you said, it changes everything. So what needs to be done? Well, first, that you have to break the taboo about your death experience. The taboo. Because people who have any death experience are silent. When they try to share their experience with others, it's not accepted by doctors, by nurses, by family members, by partners. More than 50% have a divorce because they change. Mm -hmm. So we first have to change the, the, that we accept the near death experience in society. Nine million people in the United States have had a near death experience, but they are silent. Secondly, is that we have to change uh, the scientists as well to give them the information about the near-death experiences and about the conclusions about the mind-brain relationship. And this is why I've written articles, I've written a book, and I lecture also in universities and, and hospitals and, and for psychologists, for, for, for medical schools, for philosophy schools. So it's, it's 
that's the other aspect that and in Holland now it's the paradigm is changing already. I get more and more receive more and more invitations to lecture for scientific groups. But you realize there's this there must be a, a stigma against this because if uh, doctors come to the point of view that you're proposing, I imagine there might be a fear of a loss of credibility, yeah. and so there's a certain uh, stubbornness about accepting these new ideas. Yeah, yeah. I, I can understand why there is so many reluctance to accept it. Because, because you, when you first heard about it, you were reluctant to accept it yourself, uh, many years ago. Yes, I, because it was new for me, but it was not really reluctance, because I, I was so curious about it. So I accepted it, but it was new for me because it did did fit with what I had learned in as a, in a medical school. Uh, but people, scientists, uh, are indeed reluctant because they fear, they're frightened that they lose their ground where they're of their science. They mm -hmm. lose the ground of the position. They lose the, the research money. So I can understand their reluctance and also know that. The private opinion can sometimes be different from the official opinions they have as a professor. Right. Well, Dr. Van Lommel, this has been, uh, your research has been uh, very inspiring, and perhaps your book uh, will uh, inspire people to open up a bit. I noticed that just yesterday Clint Eastwood came out with a movie, The Hereafter, and so there's, <laughs> there's more uh, public. Uh, What's this called? The Hereafter? Hereafter. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. If you haven't heard of it? No. I saw it yesterday. It's a okay. good movie. Okay. Yeah. And it explores a near-death experience and the psychic phenomena that comes along with it in, a, I think, a very straightforward and clear way. It's a good movie. It's objective? It's, it's, it's objective. Without prejudices, etc. Okay. It's from Hollywood or what is it? It's from Hollywood, yes. Okay. Yeah. The hereafter. Okay. The hereafter. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see things are changing this, at this yeah. very moment, in the past 24 hours. And that's what I mean. that. The general public will accept it more easily than the scientists. As also, though, we, we know that about 50 to 60 percent of people in, in the United States believe in some form of afterlife, mm -hmm. and uh, about it, the combination of spirituality and, and the belief in afterlife is perhaps even more. But the, the 200 scientists from the Academy of Science in the United States only 7% is religious or spiritual, and 93 does, don't believe anything at all. Mm -hmm. And your opinion also in science is also made by your private opinion about what is possible, private opinion about belief, about religion, about spirituality. And these 200 uh, scientists have the positions in, 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 in scientific journals, etc. So. It's hard to get this kind of subjects into the mainstream science. I know there are uh, a few people who are actually evangelical atheists. For some of these people, they stress evolution as proof that uh, spirituality is a myth. But, uh, okay, there may be evolution, but that does not take into account the matter of consciousness, which frankly baffles uh, many of these evangelical atheists. So, in your own mind, how do you reconcile consciousness as being non-local with evolution? How did consciousness uh, come to be um, uh, something that is registered by the brain as a, a TV receiver, as you imply? I think because we have, I've changed the concept. Uh, where is non-local consciousness? It's everywhere. It has always been, and for me, consciousness is fundamental in the universe. And everything comes from this non-local consciousness. So all the material aspects we see, we perceive and see and construct because of our consciousness. So consciousness is primary, fundamental, and and matter will change, like we talked about the neuroplasticity. Your brain function and structure changes because of changes in consciousness. So evolution is a change in the function of a, of a person, of change of, you, uh, of, of, of people, because of changes in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is a quantum view that it's called downward causation. Uh, 
upward con causation is evolution from atoms, we get molecules, to cells, to body, to brain, and consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain, an accident, essentially. But the opposite view is downward causation, where, there is, where consci consciousness is primary and infusing the universe, as you say, and con this consciousness is actually the source of uh, uh, creation, of matter. Would you comment on that? I agree. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the second option. I agree because what I, that's what I tell, told you. Consciousness is primary. Consciousness is fundamental in the universe. Right. Everything originates from consciousness. And that is a radical view from what we've been used to. Yes, but I'm not alone in this. <laughs> I know, but even though it's a radical view, a new view, it has existed for thousands of years. Yes, nothing is new. I also have written a chapter in my book, there's nothing new under the sun. It, what I, let's say, we can come in contact because of the people within the death experience, within a wisdom that has been known for thousands of years in, 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 in Eastern countries, but also in Egypt, in, by Plato, by, by the, the Kabbalah, it's a Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and, uh, uh, what we call primitive people, primitive uh, uh, cultures. They have known this for all, always. There's nothing new. But because of the Western science of the last two centuries, it has been lost and not accepted anymore. How did this happen? How did it become lost? What precipitated uh, a break with this ancient knowledge? Well, that was Newton with his physics and Descartes with the, the difference between body and the brain and, and the body and, and the, the spirit or the whatever. So the consciousness. So they said there are two th different things. We can just study the, the physical aspects of a human being, but not consciousness. So consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> yeah. I think that in psychiatry, if uh, a patient reported uh, a near-death experience, that that would not fit into the uh, uh, paradigm of psychiatric knowledge. And that person might be considered maybe insane or a little bit mentally unstable. And the course of the treatment in that psychiatry would be to uh, disabuse the person of these mistaken notions. So it, it is really disturbing to me that uh, this paradigm that has been accepted for so long has been used to uh, actually prohibit a person's full potential and to, uh, what is the word, to uh, marginalize him to society. I, I really find to that Western society. to Western society. That's a very heavy near death experience in India. Everybody will give the, the congratulations that they're happy for you that you had a near death experience. But in the Western community, it's not accepted because it's impossible. So, and I also know people. It's perceived within, as being impossible. Exactly. And, and I know some people with a near death experience who were just put in isolation by his psychiatrist because he's just kept on talking about this experience and it was not accepted. I find that shocking. That it is shocking. It is shocking. And it has to change. Because these experiences that make people uh, more loving, more accepting, more curious about the world, less egocentric, uh, you know, a, a psychiatrist who is supposed to be promoting mental health mm -hmm. is actually trying to prevent mental health. It's, it's ignorance. And sometimes I think it's willful ignorance. And willful ignorance is about as bad as you can get. I, I think so. It's a lot of prejudice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we are open for the changes of people, their death experience, we change the way we live and we can, everybody can change the way we live. Mm -hmm. If you change your consciousness. Right. Dr. Van Lommel, um, Ians, the International Association for Near-Death Studies some years ago set out to prove uh, the NDE or non-locality non by using the methods of the materialists. But this has limited use. But if you change your perspective to non-locality, you come from that spiritual place, but 
you alienate the materialists. So what is the best approach for this? The best approach is that you change your physics. We have to change the old-fashioned Newtonian physics into quantum physics. And in quantum physics, first of all, consciousness is primary. Secondly, we know the concept of non-locality in quantum physics, which has been proven. There's a connection without time, without distance. Two particles are connected instantaneously. There's an interconnectedness. And this is non-local. And this is exactly what people tell us in their near-death experience. Mm -hmm. So when you accept quantum physics, you can accept the non-local aspects of consciousness as well. If non-locality uh, becomes the new paradigm, how do you imagine that the world will change? Well, I think the most important thing is when we re re realize that there is no local connection, that we are connected, that we are connected as human beings. Everybody is connected. So when you start wars or aggression towards others, you do it to yourself as well. When you uh, treat the planet Earth as we do now, you treat yourself as bad. So when you know that everything is connected, you change the way you treat others, and you change the way you treat the planet. And we can't, can't ask for anything better than that. Yes. <laughs> yes. But we, we, we have to think of the future, for where children and grandchildren will have to live and survive. And they won't survive if we go on like this. Dr. Van Lommel, I'd like to thank you very much for your comments today. You're welcome. <laughs>